As we're ready to go this morning, I hope you're ready. We're ready to jump into the Word. We're ready to get into the book of Acts. If you've been with us for the past few weeks, we've been journeying through this series that we're now calling Outward Bound. I finally come up with a clever name for it. It took me a while, but uh, I've been a little busy, <laughs> but I finally found a good name. So we've been going through the book of Acts. That's in the Bible, for those of you who are not aware, and it's uh, called a series called Outward Bound. If you missed anything, I highly encourage you to look back on our YouTube channel. It has all of our previous content uh, for these past few weeks. It also has, uh, well, you can also check out the podcast app because there's some great content there as well. So our jumping off point back in week one was Acts chapter one, verse eight. And in that, Jesus told his earliest followers that they would be given God's power and his presence. And then that would propel them to complete the mission of spreading the good news of Jesus' life, his death, and his resurrection. And they were going to do that in Jerusalem, uh, which was the city that was the major city center close to them where Jesus was, was crucified and he rose again. They were going to start in Jerusalem, and then they were going to spread out around the countryside. And then all around the world, the gospel would continue to get spread further and further and further away, all right, because of God's power and presence propelling them forward. And we said that that same promise that the, the, the early followers of Jesus had, that God was be with them, that he would fill them with his supernatural power, is available to us today. All right, this is not just a, a one-time thing way back when. This is available to us. We can, we can accept and receive and be blessed with right here, right now, today, and that we are called to be on that same mission. This is why we're here. This is the whole point of doing this live stream. This whole point of we gather as a church is to be his people, to spread the good news of Jesus and to be filled with that power and presence. We said that we're called to a movement that's on a mission, right? And to live out a life that is passionately pursuing Christ and calling others to join him while we travel outward, away from comfort and towards completion. This week, our journey takes us to that next outward circle in the book of Acts. If you recall, last week we talked about Stephen, right? If you didn't, catch up on the podcast or YouTube. We talked about Stephen and how he died ultimately for his faith. They were stoned to death. We see that after that stoning, that thousands, and there was possibly up to 10,000 in the city, those thousands of Jesus' followers, they were a little scared, which is reasonable, and they didn't want to be next, and they had families to take care of, and they had all these things, so they started to move out. Instead of being put in prison or being persecuted or potentially killed, they started to move out of the city and spread out into the countryside. But you see, even as they did that, even as they were moving away from where their faith had started, they didn't leave it behind. They carried it with them. And as they traveled throughout the countryside, they would stop and tell others. You see, their lives had impacted in such a way that they couldn't stop. That wasn't an option. They didn't say, well, that was just a one-time thing that I felt that one time that it was great and we, we had great times together as, as this big group of people in the city and everything was happy and we were sharing things and it was great and wonderful. It was this Woodstock moment back hundreds, thousands of years ago. But they said, we're not going to leave it there. We've been changed in such a way that we can't go back to the way we were before. And so we're going to carry it forward, and we're going to share that transformational news with everybody we meet. You see, the threat of homelessness, the threat of job loss, the threat of death, nothing was going to stop them from living forward and telling others about Jesus. So they left the city, and they would stop and tell others about that transformation so that others could be transformed. One of those was a man named Philip, and that's kind of where we're going to settle this morning a little bit on this man and his journey, particularly one moment in it. He was one of the, the seven, if you remember last week, like Stephen, that had been chosen to simply pass out meals to widows. That was his job. He was to go out to the town and give out food and assistance to widows who couldn't support themselves because they didn't have families around. That was his sole job. But as he went, he continued to have conversations, much like Stephen, and he continued to be filled with that same power and presence. And so he couldn't help but tell others about Jesus. And so as he traveled outward, from the city, he kept looking for opportunities to love and to serve others, but also to proclaim that good news to anybody who would listen. Now, we're going to take a deep dive into one of those opportunities this morning. But before we do that, I want to dial it back to today. If you're anything like me, and uh, you, you probably are not, but 
this is my life right now, right? This pandemic, this response that we've been living through has kind of put me in a bit of a rut. <laughs> I'll be the first to admit it. I, I was pretty much a homebody before. Uh, I, I didn't really have this, this, this exciting life that I was living. You know, I wasn't out there on the, on the front lines doing anything crazy. I was just living this normally family man life, it, just doing the kind of the daily stuff. But it's gotten even worse <laughs> lately uh, since we've been stuck at home. Uh, and, you know, after the initial shock of having to be home, everything kind of settled into a pattern. Maybe it's it the same for you. Like the first couple of weeks is like, oh, what do we do? And now it's like, oh, well, now I have the same deal, right? So I, I'd wake up and I still do this even though things are reopening. About the same time every day I kind of wake up and I see the same people in my bed every day when I get up. Not that that's a bad thing, <laughs> but it's the same people when I wake up, usually a kid or two in the bed with me. Uh, and then I go downstairs and I have the same cup of coffee every day. And then I take a look at the same eight other faces that are in my house uh, every single day. And then I walk those 24 steps to the office and then the 24 steps back at the end when I'm done. And uh, then I eat my supper. And then I get in a workout if I'm motivated, which sometimes I am, sometimes I'm not, right? And then we put the kids to bed. You know, then we Netflix and chill. And then it's time to, to go to bed and start the whole day over again. And it gets more than a routine. Like I said, it gets to be a rut. <laughs> it gets to be crazy, crazy ordinary. <laughs> and there's nothing particularly wrong with any of that. And maybe you've experienced that. Maybe you're living through that right now and during this response of like, man, this is just every day is like Groundhog Day, right? That's kind of my life right now. Maybe it's yours. It's, it's very mundane. It's very ordinary. And there's nothing wrong with that. But ordinary can lull us into a false sense of reality, can it? What I mean is sometimes we, we get into the routine, we get into the rut, and what we see, do, and what happens to us becomes all there is. And we don't look beyond the moment that we're in. And we, we start to believe that the things that we are seeing right now, the things that we're hearing right now in the moment, the things that we can touch, the things that we can create and control, that that's all there is. And there's never going to be anything else, that this is going to be what we're in forever, or this is going to be our existence forever. This is just a mundane, ordinary routine, and we just had to live it out day after day after day. Some of you may have taken this Memorial Day weekend as things reopen as an opportunity to get out of your rut, and I hope you did. But others may be still living through that cycle as we're battling through. Maybe your life is generally this cycle. But th this is things that we battle. But what we're going to find in our text this morning is that there is more, a lot more to life than that. A lot more to life than the ordinary that we see day to day. And that God is ready and willing to use our ordinary events and transform them into extraordinary encounters. All right, let's get that this morning. I want you to get excited. I want you to get ready. I want you to lean in because God is ready to take your ordinary and turn it into extraordinary. We're going to find out how and why in just a minute. So let's dive into Acts chapter 8, verses 26 through 40. If you, don't, if you have a Bible, open it. If you don't, find it on your phone, find it on your device, wherever you're at. Acts chapter 8, verse 26, where we're going to find that God is ready to meet us in the ordinary, right? In the ordinary. So let's look. Acts chapter 8, verse 26, and see how God's going to use these ordinary events for extraordinary purposes. Okay, so let's look today. Acts chapter 8, verse 26 says, Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Remember, we just talked about Philip, all right? He says, rise and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place, all right? Now, if you remember back to the very first message in the series, we discussed the importance of doing what? Oh, you don't remember? I, I wouldn't either. So I had to go back and look, <laughs> all right? I looked this week. We had discussed the importance of waiting and listening for God. Not for an inner voice in ourselves, not for some deep-seated uh, force around us, but to a personal God who is ready to speak into our lives if we are ready to wait and listen. You may remember the phrase that we had that week as we said, as you're going, stop, right? That in our day-to-day -day lives, we can get so wrapped up into the routine, so wrapped up into the busyness or the craziness that we have to take a moment to pause and use that pause for a purpose, to be able to con reconnect or connect for the first time to the God of the universe who's ready to speak into your life. 
That's it. To be able to see through the ordinary, we have to understand that God is still speaking today. The question always has been, always will be, are we ready to listen? To Philip that morning, or that day, it doesn't really say it was morning or not. Let's say it was. It didn't really matter. To Philip, this is a no-brainer, right? He was all in on Jesus at this point. He was ready to do anything for Christ. He, had, he, had, he was ready. And so since he was ready to do that, he had already crafted this habit of waiting and listening. And so he was already ready to, to, sit and, to sit still and say, okay, God is speaking to me today. I'm going to hear it. But he also had this special ability that most of us don't have anymore. And it's the ability to be flexible, right? So to see through the ordinary to the extraordinary in our lives, we have to not only be ready to listen, but to be flexible. If you're a control freak like me, that's incredibly hard <laughs> because I love calendars. I love plans. I love schedules. I love to map everything out and make sure that all my little ducks are in a row and make sure everything's lined up so that whenever we get to the next step, that we're ready to get to the next step, okay? I love doing that. I love those things because they're familiar, they're reliable, they help me to, to make sense of my world in a, in a way, you know? But following Jesus means that we can't be so set on our own path that we're unwilling to listen for a change in direction. So I want to make sure you understand, and I understand this, I had to wrestle with this all the time, that we don't get so busy making our own plans that we miss the plan God has for us. Catch that this morning, all right? Wherever you're at, whatever you're going through, listen to that again. Don't be so busy making the plans in your life that you miss the plans that God has for you. Now, that can be incredibly hard, but it's what we have to do. We have to listen and be flexible. Philip listened as God called him from comfort and what did he call him to? This is a great thing here. Don't, don't miss this. He called him from a, from a comfortable place to a highway. To a highway. Not just a flat highway, all right? So we understand in, our, in this context that we're, they weren't out there paving roads, right? They were out there on this dusty, this, this crazy, lumpy uh, desert road between Jerusalem and this other city called Gaza. And it was just this crazy desert, unpopulated, uncivilized, wild land. It's like traveling through parts of Texas. Have you ever been there? Before they had flat roads, which has been a long time ago, but, or before they had paved roads. And so it's traveling through this desert place, and God was calling him to this long, rough road that, through this sparse, unpopulated desert. Now, some of you may feel like you're already traveling through a desert in your life, right? Maybe you're in that rut and the routine and it's just like a bumpy road where you just kind of, every little bump feels familiar. Like, oh, this is my coffee bump. Oh, this is my work bump. Oh, this is my kid bump. And you're just kind of used to that same old pattern, but it feels dry. It feels ordinary. It feels like you're not going to get a relief or you're not, there, that everything is just so much the same that there's nothing special anymore that it's just drained joy out of life for you. Maybe your life is like that. Every day you wake up with the same scenery, and no matter how far you think you've come, it still looks and feels the same. And you battle that moment of isolation day in and day out. You battle that lack of rest, even though you have all the time in the world to rest. You battle the lack of peace, even though it may be the quietest time in your life. But for others, maybe you're not. Maybe you're fine. Maybe your life's busy. Maybe you don't feel like you're in a desert. Maybe you feel like you're, you're rolling and things are going great. But when you start to listen, catch this because this is going to seem, seem counterintuitive. When you start to listen, there's going to be times when God calls you to the desert. Okay. There's going to be times where you're living and things are going to be going great and jobs are rolling in and money's flowing and kids are doing fantastic and everything is going so good. You're like, man, I have been so blessed. Right. Hashtag blessed, it's all over the place. And whenever people put that hashtag in their Instagram feeds or in their Facebook feeds or wherever they are, it's hashtag blessed. It means, oh, I've got something good going on right now. Hashtag blessed, though, in the Bible and those who follow Jesus means not having good things going on, but having God things going on. And sometimes that means being called from comfort to a desert. And that seems counterintuitive. 
And it seems like, why, if God wants to bless me, if God wants to fill me with joy, if he wants to make extraordinary events happen, why do I have to be taken to a place of pain and discomfort and, and all these things? Why can't I just stay where I'm at? And that's when you got to love, trust, and believe that he knows what's better for you than you do. That's hard. It's necessary. And when you allow him to call you to those places, that's when the ordinary can become the extraordinary. We spend our lives running from those things. We spend our lives running from those hard decisions we have to make, from running from when we know that God has called us to something different. But he's saying if you just listen and you're a little flexible, you'll see that though it may hurt, that there is a point to the pain. There's a greater purpose than what your day-to-day -day life looks like. Philip listened in that brief moment, and I'm sure he thought when he heard the words, he said, wait a minute, what are we going to do out there? Why am I going out there? I want to tell others about you. I want, I want to be able to share the good news to as many people as possible, and you're going to send me to the middle of nowhere with no help, just me. What's the point of that? That doesn't make sense. You see, following Jesus means accepting the fact that there will be times where we're called to places that aren't pleasant and understand again that there is a point to the pain. To Philip's credit, this is where we need to get as, as believers, if you're a follower of Christ, if you're not, we're going we're gonna to get to that. But if you are, this is where we need to get as a follower of Jesus. We need to understand that, that like Philip did, that if there is a doubt, throw it off to the side and know that there's a greater point and go th and follow through on that call. All right, so Philip quickly dispelled uh, those doubts. The very next verse, it says in verse 27 of chapter 8 in Acts, it says, and he rose and went. That's it. And he rose and went. He's like, whoop, I got it. See ya. He rose and went. And there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, it says, a queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. And he had come to Jerusalem to worship. So he traveled from Africa to Jerusalem, and it says he was returning, seated in his chariot, and he was reading the prophet Isaiah. All right, that's a, another one of those Old Testament prophets uh, way back in the, one of the thicker books of the Bible. I encourage you to read that. It's pretty difficult, but I encourage you to read it. And so he was reading through what wouldn't have been a Bible, reading through the scroll that he laid out in his chariot. And he probably had somebody else reading it to him because he was very important, and he probably wouldn't have taken the time to read. But it was being read to him. Uh, it was being read aloud, as, as was the custom in the day. And so Philip went on God's command. He went to the desert not knowing what he was going to find. He went thinking, well, well, this is probably just going to be, maybe it's just an ordinary day, but I'm going to go where God has called me and I'm going to see what happens. And so he goes and he sees, surprise, there's somebody on the road in the middle of this sparse place, in the middle of this desert land. He sees somebody there. You see, obedience opens opportunity. Get that this morning. Obedience opens opportunity. And because of Philip's obedience, this ordinary road in an ordinary desert was about to become a place of an extraordinary encounter. You see, he sees this chariot, but it's not just any chariot, right? It's a royal chariot. It's a very decorative chariot. It's pulled by these, these awesome looking horses that are, that are pulling this, this, this beautiful sight through this ordinary desert road. And in this chariot, we have the eunuch. You have a couple of people around him because he probably had attendants. And uh, this, this eunuch was, was not just ordinary, right? He was an Ethiopian eunuch, a, a eunuch from Africa. But he was also in charge of the royal treasury. He had gone to Jerusalem to worship God. Apparently, he had heard about him. We don't know how the context, but apparently, he at some point, he had heard enough about God to know that he needed to go to Jerusalem. Maybe he'd come in contact with some, some Jews in the area, and he said, man, I got to find out about this God. And so, he had gone to Jerusalem, and he bought a scroll of the prophet Isaiah, and he was reading it out loud. And now, for those of us who may be unfamiliar with his concept, eunuchs are not popular in our time. Thank you, Jesus. Right? I'm glad I didn't live 2,000 years ago or before that when eunuchs were fairly popular because you, you know, it may have happened. <laughs> All right? So for those of you who are not, not aware of what a eunuch is, uh, we need to clarify that this man is, one, most likely a slave. All right? He wasn't free. He was a slave in the court of this Ethiopian queen. And he was castrated probably from a young age. All right? Uh, much like if you're a Game of Thrones fan, 
Varys on Game of Thrones, all right? So kind of a similar story in a way, all right? So Varys, like Game of Thrones, if you're familiar with that show, in their time, much like on that show, eunuchs were ridiculed. It was not a good thing, as you can imagine, guys, but even ladies, it wasn't a great thing to be a eunuch, okay? And so uh, they were ridiculed for their condition, and it, occasionally, not often, but occasionally they would be given important positions in royal courts like this man was. But even if they did rise to a high station, they were still limited, okay? They could never have a family of their own. They would never own land. They would never pass on an inheritance. And even in accordance with Jewish law at the time, they could worship God, but they could only get so close, all right? I'm not going to explain the whole temple hierarchy, but there was, there was feet of distance depending on your status in society. And so for people who were foreigners, and particularly for eunuchs, they weren't allowed anywhere close to the inside of the temple. They had to stay on the outside looking in. They were removed from God's power and his presence. They were cut off, not only physically, but socially and spiritually. They're always on the periphery, but never apart, never really included. Perhaps that's where some of us are at this morning. Maybe we've obtained position, reputation, Maybe people know us, respect us. Maybe we have a sense of security in our lives, that we have a nice house or the rent's paid for and everything's going great. Maybe we build up a little bit of money on the side for retirement if that still exists in this, in this society. Uh, we've, we've done these things. We've worked hard to keep up appearances because it's in those things that we find our identity and our value, isn't it? But no matter how hard we work, or how many incredible Instagram photos we post or the far from places we visited or how good we look that day, we never truly feel like we belong. We're always just on the outside. Maybe even in the midst of the crowd. Never really feel like we're apart. Never feeling like we're truly included. You see, the eunuch was in charge of a vast earthly treasure, secure in his position. He didn't have anything to worry about. He was taken care of. And yet here he was on a dusty desert ro road, reading a scroll, hoping that there was some way he, even in his condition, could get closer than six feet from God. He wanted, he needed a way in. He who had spent a lifetime keeping the inheritance of others wanted an inheritance for himself. And see, then that moment, riding in that chariot, reading that scroll, an ordinary occurrence for him just another day of the week, that ordinary day was about to become an extraordinary encounter because God's power and presence was about to move a lot closer than six feet. He was about to get in the chariot with him. Acts 8, verse 29 through 31 says, the spirit said to Philip, so God's calling Philip back out. He says, all right, you've called you to this desert. Now you've got somewhere else to go. You see that chariot? He says, go over and join this chariot. So Philip ran. Again, look at the decisiveness of Philip. Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, do you understand what you're reading? And the man said, how can I, unless someone guides me? Because this is complicated, hard stuff, right? What am I reading? And he invited Philip to come and sit in with him. Now, that translation is okay, but I like a direct reading from the Greek a little better that says that the Spirit said to Philip, go and stick to the chariot. Not just go over and join, hang out with, stick to it, cling to it. You see, from the outside, that chariot was probably nothing exceptional. It was decorative, sure, but it was a chariot like most other chariots. Any other day, Philip might have just made a note 
He said, oh, that's a nice chariot. Well, see, that's, man, I, I really wish I could have enough money like him, and that'd be great. But Philip could have just made a note and moved on. But the Spirit moved Philip to say, go and stick to that chariot. That ordinary moment has something extraordinary inside of it, and you're going to miss it if you don't move and run and catch it right now. Jesus once told his followers, Matthew 7, 7 and 8, he says, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. And the one who seeks finds. And the one who knocks it will be opened. You see, Philip ran to that chariot that day. He caught up to it. He stuck close to it. And he heard someone who was seeking, who was asking, who was knocking on the door of heaven, who had made a thousands of mile journey to Jerusalem, only to come back and find that he was only allowed this far in. But he wanted to get closer. He wanted an extraordinary encounter, and he was ready to do anything to get it. And so when Philip came up and he said, I don't understand what's going on. I want more. I need more. Philip said, I know the answer to your questions. I know who you're knocking on. I know the door that you're knocking on. I know who's going to open that door. Let me tell you about Jesus. You see, the eunuch was knocking on heaven's door that day in his normal, everyday mode of transportation. He's driven that chariot thousands of times, back and forth, all over the place. Every day was the same old thing, but that moment and that mode of transportation was about to become a moment of transformation. Because he was asking, he was seeking, he was knocking. He wasn't content to wait and see if this was an ordinary day would just turn out to be ordinary. He was seeking the extraordinary. Now, most of us probably don't have much of a commute <laughs> these days. Maybe you do. Maybe you've been commuting. Maybe you're ramping back up, I don't know. But God can take the routine, whether it's a commute, whether it's a cup of coffee, whether it's taking a nap, whether it's an evening walk, whether it's playing NBA 2K in your Xbox One like I do just about every day. He can take those extraordinary things, or excuse me, the ordinary things, <laughs> and can make them extraordinary. It's not about what we do. It's about what, why we're doing it. It's about what we're seeking in those moments. Are we seeking just the ordinary pleasures from ordinary things, or are we wanting to push forward and get into extraordinary encounters? God can turn those ordinary moments into those encounters if we're asking, if we're seeking, if we're knocking. Philip ran and caught up to that chariot. He stuck to it. In the moment of, of the eunuch's encounter, the moment of Philip's day, the whole pinnacle was about to come in here at this moment where they're coming together. They were about to arrive. He heard those words of Isaiah. Oh, it's so important to get this context. We talk about this on Thursday, but let's give it again. He heard this prophet Isaiah being read. He heard the genuineness in the eunuch's voice as he read and knew for that moment, he said, man, I know why you call me to this desert, Jesus. I know that this wasn't a fluke. I know this wasn't my imagination. I know that what you call me here was, was painful, that the journey was hard, but it was worth it for this moment right here, right now. You see, the eunuch was reading Isaiah 53. In Isaiah 53, the prophet described a servant who was beaten. He was killed, not for his own crimes, but for the crimes of others. And Philip explained that that man who was prophesied hundreds of years before had come. He was a man named Jesus. That he was accepted and loved by God, that he was fully included in God's family. He was one in perfect union with the creator in heaven above, and yet he willingly stepped out, stepped down from that throne and came to humanity, not to be worshiped, but to be rejected, to be treated as an outsider, to be spit on, to be mocked, to be crucified, to be excluded from the presence of God. And all so that by his death and resurrection, all who believed in him would be taken from the outside and brought inside. You see, just two chapters after Isaiah 53 is Isaiah 55 in Isaiah 56, where we're going we're gonna to read something from it this morning. And we're going to see how the servant who suffered and died opened the door for an extraordinary encounter. Isaiah 56, 
three through five, especially for that eunuch. Listen here. Watch the providence of God at work. He was reading from that drive back from Jerusalem. He got to Isaiah 53. He saw the suffering servant, didn't understand what it meant. Philip explains it to him, and he was going to read on his rest of the way back to his home in Africa. He was going to read Isaiah 56, three through five, which said this. He says, let not the foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord say, the Lord will surely separate me from his people. Remember, he had gone to Jerusalem. He was stepping back. He was far away from God. But God said, through the suffering servant, through my son Jesus who died for you, you are not separated from me. Let not the eunuch say, oh, I was speaking to him right there that day. Let not the eunuch say, behold, I'm a dry tree. In other words, I can't have anything. I don't have a family. I don't have an inheritance. I'm, I'm dried up. I'm just here to serve others and just live out this existence. He said, behold, I am not a dry tree. For thus says the Lord to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, who choose the things that please me and hold fast, stick to that covenant, my covenant. I will give what? I will give my house, meaning I will give everything I have. And within my walls, a monument and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. <laughs> Oh, my goodness. You see, the unit thought he was going back to his house that day, but he was really about to be brought into the father's house that day. He may have spent a life being cut off physically, socially, and spiritually, but through Jesus, those who have been cut off are being grafted back in. You see, his death and his resurrection take a people who are locked in a desert and rains down Holy Spirit water on them. You may be. In a desert this morning, you may be in the ordinary routine, the rut of your life, but trust me, through Jesus, the extraordinary is here. You may be traveling through this ordinary life, but God is calling out to you this morning. He is ready to turn your, extra your ordinary into extraordinary. If you feel like you've been on the outside looking in, you say, man, I've got all these things. I've attained all this wealth. I'm a status. I have this position. I have this authority. People look up to me. I maybe even have a great family. Maybe even have everything I want, but something's still missing. I still feel like I'm on the outside looking in. <laughs> Through Jesus, he brings you in the house. Jesus brings you in the house this morning. If you've been feeling like there's something more than this ordinary routine existence, if you're tired of fighting, clawing, trying to earn your identity, Jesus is opening the door to heaven to you right now. And he's ready to give you a name and an inheritance that is everlasting. Watch the providence of God here in this next verse. Watch as he spoke and, and met that eunuch right where he's at and brought him into the family of God. Right here in Acts chapter 8, verse 36 through 39, it says this. He said, and as they were going along the road, they came to some water. Whoa, wait a minute. They were in a desert. <laughs> where we are limited, God is limitless. They came to a pool of water in this desert. And the eunuch said, see, here is water. Wait, wait a minute. What prevents me from being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch together. And I imagine this scene, and I imagine that the eunuch is so thrilled, that he, he's just so pumped. Not only has he heard about the good news, that he has found what he has been searching for. He has found his identity, that it is not just someone who's cut off, but it's someone who's brought in. And he's found this moment, and God provides this pool where he can make this profession, where he can make it known to the attendant sitting in his chariot, to Philip, to anybody who may have been wandering on that road today, where this guy's going to get out and be dunked in the middle of this pool, in the middle of this desert. And I can imagine him dragging Philip down with him. They coming back up together and celebrating together because in the ordinary moment they have found the extraordinary <sighs> he baptized him it says philip did and when they came up out of the water the spirit of the lord carried philip away so philip leaves and, and the eunuch saw him no more but the eunuch wasn't concerned about philip not being there because he knew that the person who he really needed to be in touch with he knew the person that needed to ride in his chariot wasn't philip but it was jesus and so he went on his way he got back in that chariot sopping wet and sat down and said we're going home because <laughs> i know where i'm going not just back home to africa not back home to the courts of the queen but the courts of the king of the universe 
an extraordinary encounter in an ordinary day. You see, there's no such thing as coincidence when God's involved. Here they are in the middle of the desert, and just the right time they come across that pool of water. When you're following Jesus, God gives you just what you need right when you need it. God provided that water. He didn't need it to, to be saved. He didn't need it to be brought into the family. He provided it so that the unit could show others that he was ready and willing to go all in on Jesus, that he was accepted, that his old life was gone, that no longer was he the cutoff eunuch, that he was the son of a king, not a servant, but a son. <laughs> that day started out as just an ordinary day, but it ended with an extraordinary encounter with the God who takes those on the outside and brings them in through Jesus. If you're a seeker this morning, like that eunuch, and you're here, maybe you've been shared, this post has been shared with you. Share this post, people. If you've been shared this post this morning and you've listened and you've bared with me all the way here to, to this moment, this is for you. If you've been struggling with feeling like you've never fully been brought in, you've always had to work so hard, and you feel like if I don't work hard today, tomorrow I'm not worth it. <laughs> Throw out that lie right now. If you've been going through your routine and you've gotten to a rut and you're like, man, all there is is what I see. There is more to life than this. There is more to life than what you're going through. It's there. And Jesus is ready to bring you into that extraordinary encounter right here, right now. Do not miss this moment. Don't miss it. If you're ready to walk in to the house today, if you're ready to be brought into God's family, to give this new identity that you can never lose, that you don't have to earn and you'll never, ever lose, all you have to do is accept him. Say, man, I, th this is real. This is it. This is what I'm here for. And I'm ready to believe and trust and follow you. It's not going to be easy. Philip was called to a desert. There's going to be moments where it's going to be hard. But the promise is that he makes you secure. You don't have to fight and earn it. He is the one who provides even water in the desert. So I pray the Holy Spirit reigns on you this morning where you're at. If you're ready to make that decision, you're ready to say, man, I'm ready to go into the deep, into the Father's house. We're going to give you an opportunity to do that in just a minute. If you still want to roll down the road in your chariot, that's okay too. We encourage you to make the decision, but we know that faith is a journey. And we know that some moments you're ready and some moments you're not. But we want you to keep pressing in. Keep pressing in. Don't sit back and say, eh, that's just a random pool of water in the middle of the desert. That's just, that's just a random special occurrence in the middle of my ordinary life. Eh, it's just a blink on the road. I'll, I'll move past it. And just, you don't even look to catch it. Don't treat it as a one-time thing. Keep seeking it. Because God is still seeking you. He is still ready for you this morning. When you're ready, he's ready to take you in the house. So keep joining us here week after week. More of them back up. Come sit with us, all right, six feet apart, but come sit with us and be a part of our family and let's show you what living in Jesus' house, the Father's house, looks like, okay? But if you already made the decision, we're gonna give you an opportunity to do that this morning. We want you to. Don't miss that. For believers, for believers this morning, you ready? It's not gonna be, this is not gonna be easy. We need to remember that we've all been the eunuch, We've all been on the outside and ready to look in, but we all need to be Philip. Get that this morning. We've all been the eunuch. We all need to be Philip. We've all been on the outside looking in until Christ brings us into the house. And while every day should be a celebration, that's what our Sunday morning is. When we're here together. And even now, we're celebrating that new life we have in him. That even as we're celebrating that new reality, it should motivate us to bring others in. Just like it did for Philip. I read this great quote this week. It says, it does little good 
to be in touch with the Spirit and the Word if we are not in touch with people. If Philip didn't allow Jesus' love to drive him to love others, he would never have taken a trip to the desert to bring the good news to a black man. When it happened. Never. He was in touch with people and genuinely cared for them and about them. And he used every ordinary opportunity as a means to bring the love of Jesus to them like water in a desert. Believers this morning, are we ready to do the same? Let's pray this morning. As all heads are bowed and all eyes are shut, if you're a seeker and you're ready to, make, to accept Jesus, you're ready to walk into the house, he's already opened the door. He is already ready for you. So if you're here this morning online with us, checking us out, and you've, you've come to this moment, you've lasted this long, here's your chance to get into the water, to meet an extraordinary God who loves and cares for you and is going to give you a new name that you can't earn. So if you're ready to follow through on that, if you're ready to walk into the house this morning, here's how you do that. You simply pray. It's not complicated. It's not fancy. It's not a special set of words. It's none of those crazy things. It is simply acknowledging that you need Jesus, which is hard but necessary, and that you're ready to give everything to him, and you're ready to, to be in the house. So let's pray together to meet that right here, right now. Dear Jesus, we thank you, Father, that you are here, God. Lord, as, as the seekers gather, Lord, I pray that we pray this prayer together to you. Jesus, I'm sorry. I've been looking and searching and looking and searching and looking and searching and everything I find leaves me wanting. That I've strived to look good, to be good, to do good. And it's still not enough. And every day it kind of falls into a pattern. Let's get into a rut and I want out. And I want to be brought in that I want to be grafted in. I want to be brought into the house. Lord, please help me. Take me who feels cut off and bring me in. God, help me to follow you. Father, forgive me for all the things I messed up, but help me to follow you now, to live today like never have I ever lived a day and live it all for you. If that's you this morning and you prayed that for the first time, Ms. Dawn's going to post a comment in this section. And all you got to do is like it. It's easy. Don't let this seemingly ordinary moment be missed because it can become extraordinary. So she's going to post the comment. You're going to like that. We're going to follow up with you. We're not going to call you out and, 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 and harass you and send you lots of mail, all this crazy stuff. I just want to connect with you and say, hey, you've taken that first step. Now let's go the rest of the way together because it's hard to walk alone, and we're called to do it together. We're called to a movement doing this together. So we're going to walk it with you, and it's going to be awesome. So like that comment. Don't miss it. Say, I'll do it next week. I'll do it next time. Don't miss it. Who knows what you have left? I don't know. I'm not trying to scare you into it, but you don't know what's happening tomorrow. Don't miss the moment today. For believers and, and everyone here, let's, let's close in this prayer. Jesus, help us to remember that we've been brought in the house and to remember that we have promises that are sure in you. And that, God, that we can be full of confidence and hope because of your life, death, and resurrection, Jesus. And, God, that we know that that is the way in the house. And that, God, through your life, through your death, through your resurrection, for all who believe in you, we are given a life everlasting, a life fulfilled, an identity in you that is so rich, that is so full, that of inheritance that is so much more than anything we could gather here, Jesus. I pray that we remember that, that we take hold of that, that we cling to that hope, that God, that we share it, God, that we give it, God, that we are listening to you and listening to others who are seeking after you and say, hey, I know of the guy you need to meet. I know of that person who is water in the desert. I know of the one who's going to bring you in the house. Let me share him with you. Let us be ready 
not waiting, ready to jump in when you call us, ready to share that good news with anyone and everyone that we run into, Jesus. God, we pray that in your most holy name. Amen and amen. Thank you so much, church and guests, for joining us this morning. Enjoy this Memorial Day. Thank you so much, veterans, for tomorrow, by the way. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for all that you've done, for the sacrifices you've made. I pray that we reflect not only on your sacrifice, but on the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross as we remember this Memorial Day that saves us and gives us freedom not only in our physical lives, but in our spiritual lives as well and for all of eternity. So I thank you for visiting us. Thank you, veterans. Enjoy your weekend. Enjoy your Memorial Day. And we'll see you next week, church.